We are continuing the series we have called, uh, called The Unknowns, and we're looking at some of the lesser known or uh, unknown to you, maybe, uh, people in the Bible, uh, even unknown to me. Some of these folks I look at and go, I don't remember this person at all. Uh, so it's been really interesting for me to, to uh, discover, like, Doeg last week. I don't think I'd ever really studied about Doeg until I prepared for that sermon. So it's been, I hope you enjoyed, I hope it's been a blessing. If you missed any of the sermons, you can find a link to them on our website, gatheringatl.com. But today I want to look at someone who's mentioned in the very first book of the Bible, someone mentioned in the book of Genesis. So if you have your Bible uh, or your phone, you can go to Genesis right now. But we're going to look at a guy by the name of Reuben. Reuben. So who's Reuben? Reuben was Jacob's oldest son. Some of you may remember Jacob. Jacob was Isaac's son, right? And Isaac was Abraham's son. So Reuben was Abraham's great-grandson. And you may remember that his dad, Jacob, had a twin named Esau. And you remember what he did to Esau, right? He got Esau to uh, trade his birthright for some soup. And, and then he tricked his elderly father, Isaac, into believing that he was Esau. So Isaac would give him the blessing of the firstborn, right? The blessing of the firstborn. That was a big deal back then, blessing of the firstborn. And a lot, in some parts of the world today, it, 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 it's still a big deal. Reuben was Jacob's firstborn. And so the inheritance was his, right? It was his the moment he was born. But tragically, as we're going to see, Reuben would not only lose his birthright, but he would also doom his descendants. So here's the truth for us today. We cannot receive God's blessing if we are not where God wants us. Hear that. We cannot receive God's blessing if we are not where God wants us. So look at Genesis chapter 49 with me. Genesis 49, starting in verse 1. It says, Then Jacob called together all his sons and said, Gather around me, and I will tell you what will happen to each of you in the days to come. Come and listen, you sons of Jacob. Listen to Israel, your father. Reuben, you are my firstborn, my strength. The child of my vigorous youth, you are first in rank and first in power. But you are as unruly as a flood, and you will be first no longer. For you went to bed with my wife. You defiled my marriage couch. Now, if all you read about Reuben was that last verse, you would say this Reuben guy is a pretty big bum, right? He sleeps with his dad's wife, right? It'd be easy to believe that this Reuben guy was just a bum from birth, but you would be wrong. See, the reality is Reuben was a pretty good dude for much of his life, and yet he lost his birthright. One weakness, one weakness brought him down and overshadowed any good that he had done. One weakness, one indiscretion, one mistake, one decision. Everything was lost because of one bad decision. One bad decision cost Reuben his blessing. One bad decision wiped away any good that Reuben had done. And listen, Reuben had done a lot of good things. If you read this entire chapter, you'll, you'll see that Reuben's, one of Reuben's brothers was Joseph. This was Joseph, the amazing Technicolor dream coat Joseph, right? The coat of many colors, that, that Joseph, right? Joseph was despised by his other brothers, so much so that Joseph's brothers decided to kill Joseph. But Reuben spoke up, and, and he said, no, 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 let's not kill him. No, 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 let's just throw him in a pit. I mean, it's not perfect, but it's better than murder, right? But his plan was, let's throw him in a pit, and then at night, he was going to go and save his brother. But his brothers decided they were just going to sell Joseph into slavery instead. And so that's what they did. Years later, all the brothers had to go to Egypt because of a famine, and Reuben called out his brothers for bring, bringing disaster on the family. Genesis 42, we find Reuben telling his brothers, didn't I tell you not to sin against the boy? But you wouldn't listen. Now we must give an accounting for his blood. In the 30th chapter of Genesis, we see Reuben bless his mother with some mandrakes. Mandrakes were believed to enhance a woman's fertility. All right, he did this because he was a good son. He loved his mom. 
you got to understand why this is important. Reuben's mom was Leah, who was Jacob's wife, but she wasn't Jacob's only wife, right? Leah's sister, Rachel, was also married to Jacob. In fact, Rachel was the sister that Jacob wanted to marry, but her father tricked him into marrying Leah first. I mean, that's pretty despicable, but God is good, and he blessed Leah by making her the mother of Jacob's firstborn, Reuben. But Rachel was always Jacob's favorite. And so Leah didn't have full access to her husband. And so when Reuben brought the mandrakes to his mom, Rachel wanted some, right? And so Leah refused, but then Rachel made her a deal. If she would share the mandrakes with Rachel, she would let Rachel sleep with Jacob. What she did, this led to her getting pregnant with another son for Jacob. In fact, in total, God blessed the unloved Leah with seven children for Jacob. So I want you to hear me this morning. You may be unloved by everyone else in the world, but I want you to hear me. God still loves you. You may be in love by everyone in your life, but God's blessings are not tied to what others think about you. Leah was unloved by Jacob, but God loved Leah, and he blessed her. And so Reuben, he loved his mom. And then in Genesis 42... Reuben and his brothers, as I said, had to go to Egypt because of a famine and to go get some grain. And when they get to Egypt, they had to speak to the man in charge. And that man in charge happened to be their brother Joseph, who they sold into slavery. Long story short, Joseph was taken to Egypt. He was eventually became steward to Potiphar, one of Pharaoh's officials. And then Potiphar's wife tried to seduce him, and he denied her, and then there were false accusations, and so he was imprisoned. But Joseph had this gift where he was able to interpret dreams, and so he started to interpret Pharaoh's dreams. And Pharaoh liked him so much, he made him governor of Egypt. And because he properly in interpreted Pharaoh's dreams, he had Pharaoh ra uh, ration some of the country's produce in preparation for the time of famine. And so the famine came, and Joseph's brothers came to Egypt. And again, they had no clue they were talking to Joseph. And instead of hating his brothers, Joseph showed them compassion, right? And he sent them home with grain and told them to return with their brother Benjamin. Now, when Jacob heard that, that he wanted Benjamin to go back to Egypt, he, he, he refused because he believed Benjamin would never come home. And that's when Reuben spoke up. And he said, you may put uh, both of my sons to death if I do not bring Benjamin back home uh, with me. And trust him to my care, and I will bring him back. See, Reuben was willing to sacrifice his own boys. I mean, clearly, Reuben was a pretty good dude. He loved his mama. He loved his dad. He loved his brothers. Pretty good guy. And yet it didn't keep him from losing his birthright. He might have done a lot of good things. But one thing destroyed it all. Again, look at what Jacob said about his son. Reuben, you are my firstborn, my strength, the child of my vigorous youth. You are first in rank and first in power. Jacob is saying, Reuben, you're the man, right? You are proof of my strength. You are proof of my manhood. You are at the top in terms of honor and in terms of praise. You are the man. This is what it means to be the firstborn son. The firstborn son has an important role to play. The firstborn son was to receive the full blessing from the father. The firstborn son was to receive a greater share of the inheritance. The first, uh, firstborn son was also given authority over the family when the patriarch died. It was an important role. And it was all Reuben's. And here, this wasn't just any other family, right? This was Abraham's family. This was Abraham's line. This was the line that would eventually lead to the Messiah. And as the firstborn, the Messiah should be a direct descendant of Reuben. And so when we trace Jesus' lineage, it should have gone Adam, Seth, Noah, Shem, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and then Reuben. But that's not what happened. Because Jacob said in verse 4, but you are as unruly as a flood, and you will be first no longer. For you went to bed with my wife and defiled my marriage couch. Now, let me read this from the NIV translation. It says, turbulent as the waters, you will no longer excel. For, when, for, uh, for you went up onto your father's bed, onto my couch, and defiled it. Reuben was turbulent. 
Reuben was like white water, water running over rocks. When I was in high school, my church youth group went rafting down the Nantahala River in North Carolina. I, I don't know if you've ever been in Nantahala or been white water rafting, but if you've ever been white water rafting, you know you are not in charge, right? I mean, you, you have your oars, and you try to get that raft to go where you want it to go, but ultimately, you are at the mercy of the water. And at the end of the run in the Antahala River, uh, you go over this small waterfall. Uh, it's, it's a big moment in the trip. They take your pictures. You go over. Um, and it, it's a pr pretty cool thing to do. And so the raft I was in, we hit the waterfall, went over, no problem. We made it, no problem. But the raft my brother was in went over the waterfall and flipped. And my brother was caught under the raft and under the water, and he couldn't get, get out. And he, right before he started to drown, he said the hand of God reached down and grabbed him and pulled him out. It was old man Wiggins, but he said it was the hand of God who pulled him out of the water and saved his life. When you are in the water, you are at the mercy of the water. There's a reason we had to sign all those waivers before we could go. Right? All the guys and all the adults uh, were committed to our safety, but they understood that turbulent water was unpredictable water. You cannot predict what turbulent water will do. Some of you have been wondering why it seems people are pulling away from you. It's because you are turbulent waters. No one knows which way you're going to go. They have no way of knowing what you will do at any given moment. Right? Reuben was not steady. Reuben was not dependable. He was turbulent. He didn't stay in his lane. You see, turbulent water destroys. I mean, look at the flooding in eastern Kentucky and Mississippi. When water overflows its banks, it disrupts and it destroys. It leaves damage in its wake. And you never know what will be destroyed. And you don't know how bad the devastation will be. Right? That's why we can't build in flood zones, right? A flood zone is the government's way of saying you don't want to build here because you can't trust this water. If it overflows its banks, your house will be destroyed. Some of you are like turbulent waters. You can't be trusted. You're unpredictable. You're wondering why everyone is keeping you at arm's length. This is why. Turbulence creates uncertainty. We know this when we fly, don't we? I don't handle turbulence well. It doesn't matter how small the turbulence is. I am convinced that the plane is about to fall apart, and I am white-knuckling everything I can grab, right? I'm terrified. Turbulence creates uncertainty. We know this when it comes to our life situations, right? When life gets turbulent, we get worried, right? We get concerned. We don't know what will happen next. We, uh, no one likes turbulence. No one wants to be around turbulence. Turbulence can't be trusted. Reuben was turbulent. Some of you are wondering why your life is so turbulent. It's because you aren't where God wants you. You aren't living within the boundaries God set for you. So what are those boundaries? Well, put simply, they're the Ten Commandments, right? Don't worship any other god. Don't make any idols. Don't take the Lord's name in vain. Remember the Sabbath. Honor your father and mother. Don't kill. Don't commit adultery. Don't steal. Don't lie. Don't be jealous of others. That's the lane we're supposed to remain in. Reuben didn't stay in those lanes. He didn't keep at least two of those commandments. And some of you are living in turbulent times because you're not keeping one or more of God's commands. That's why Jacob told Reuben, you're never going to excel. I mean, that's what we all want, right? We want to excel. We want to be special at something. We want to step out of the crowd in some way. We want to excel in something. Now, it's probably something different for each of us, but we all want to excel in some area. And the truth is, God created each of us with the ability to excel in something, to step out of the crowd in some area in our life and excel. God created you, hear me, church, God created you to excel in something. Maybe it's teaching or banking or coaching or sports or drawing or writing or medicine or selling, but it's something. God gave you the ability to excel. But maybe like Reuben, you're not excelling. And the question is why? God's got a plan for you in an area where you can excel, but you're not able to step into it 
because you're too turbulent. You aren't where God wants you to be. You want the blessing, but you aren't in position to receive the blessing. For Reuben, his inability to excel was because he held lust in his heart. He held lust in his heart. Reuben felt that if he took his father's concubine, then his place of the firstborn would be unchallengeable. Right? Reuben knew what was coming his way as, as firstborn, but instead of letting it happen in God's time, he just his lust led him to try to force the issue. Right? Reuben's sinful desires demanded his attention. And he fell for it. Our sinful desires will lie to us time and time again. They will tell us that it's that it's them, our sinful desires, that will get us what we want. Our sinful desires will tell us that they're the ones that will get us where, where God wants us to be. Right? I mean, if we believe that God wants us to be happy, then an affair might just be the answer. If we believe that God wants us just to be happy, then skimming a little money off the top might just be the answer. If we believe that God just wants us to be happy, then cheating in order to pass a test might just be the answer. When we are willing to wait on the Lord, we are more likely to get into our sinful desires to get what we want or what we think God wants for us. Reuben just could not wait. He just couldn't control his lust. And because of this, Reuben would never excel. In fact, if you look up Reuben in the Bible, you will find that after this, Reuben never accomplished anything of note. Neither did his descendants. The 12 sons of Jacob became the 12 tribes of Israel. And God would use these uh, 12 tribes to bless his people. However, it does not appear that the tribe of Reuben was used in the same way as the other tribes. No judge, no prophet, no ruler, no prince ever came out of the tribe of Reuben. In fact, the only notable people to come out of that tribe were Dathan and Abiram, and they're famous for nothing other than rebellion against Moses. In fact, when God leads his people into the promised land, Reuben's tribe is like, oh, that's okay, we're just going to settle over here on this side of the Jordan. They never accomplish anything. They become small and non-influential. You see, turbulent waters change everything downstream. Right? Rivers are, are different right before the rapids and right after the rapids. Our turbulent lifestyle changes everything downstream from us. Our turbulent lifestyle affects our children and their children. I can see this play out in my own family. I was raised by two devout Christians. My parents were raised in devout homes. But let's take the Latham side of my family. Since my mom's not here, I'll talk about the Lathams. My, my father was raised by devout parents. His parents were raised in, uh, by devout parents. My great-grandparents were raised in devout homes. And yet so many of my relatives, distant and close, have no use for the church. Some have been lost to addiction. Some have had multiple marriages. Some live in perpetual chaos. Now hear me, well, we are all responsible for our, our own decisions. The decisions our parents and our grandparents make can, can uh, make making the right decision for us even more difficult. See, Reuben was next in line. Reuben had the blessing waiting on him. Reuben had it all coming his way, but he gave in to his sinful desires, and that removed him from his place of honor. But then his kids ended up being two steps removed, and then their children were three steps removed. Do you see how this works? Each generation is farther and farther and farther away from where the family was meant to be. This means the journey back is much farther for each generation. If you are unstable water, you will not excel, and neither with your children. In fact, if you are unstable water, it is even harder for your children. See, I have seen generational sin destroy families. Broken marriages tend to lead to broken marriages. Women uh, raised in abusive homes tend to marry abusive men. Men whose fathers were unfaithful 
tend to be unfaithful husbands themselves. Generational sin destroys generations. But I'm pretty sure that Reuben never thought it would lead to this. Right? I'm pretty sure Reuben never thought that he would lose his birthright by, by sleeping with his dad's wife. I'm pretty sure that Reuben never thought his descendants would suffer. All because of just one night of lust. None of us think the worst possible outcome of our sin will actually happen. It's why people drive under the influence, right? I'm just buzzed. I'm fine to drive. That personal conversation has led to countless lives being lost. And countless lives being destroyed. We never expect the worst outcome. Right? Looking at a few inappropriate photos, that won't destroy my marriage. Having a little sip, that won't destroy my life. Scheming a couple hundred from the top at work, that's not going to lead to jail time. I doubt Reuben thought he would destroy what God had in store for him. But as I mentioned, it should have been Reuben's line that led to the Messiah. But because of his indiscretion, Jesus came to the line of Judah instead. So while we know what Reuben lost because of his one decision, what about us? You see, Reuben was as human as you and I are. He never thought he would be a lesson about what not to do. So what about us? See, we have no idea, church, what God has in store for us. We have no idea what Jesus wants to do of, in our lives for the rest of our lives. God's will for our life is not written in stone. I want this, let me just say, I am so tired of this bad theology that, that says, well, if God wants it to happen, it will just happen. If God wants it to happen, it's just going to happen. Folks, if that were true, there would be no broken marriages, right? There would be no, no lives lost to addiction. There is a lot God would like to happen that never happens because of people like you and me, right? We are in the place that we're meant to be. Therefore, what God wants to have happen cannot happen. God can't do what he wants to do. And so our children then aren't where they're meant to be. If we're, if we're not in the place we're meant to be, our marriages aren't where they're, they're meant to be. If we aren't in the place we're meant to be, our relationships aren't where they're meant to be. But I, I have a word for you, you turbulent waters. If you know that you are a turbulent water today, I have a word for you. And that word is Jesus says, be still. Jesus, the Prince of Peace, says, be still. But stillness can't make a home in your life. If you're still giving in to your sinful desires. The stillness of the Lord cannot coexist with a lustful heart. The stillness of the Lord cannot coexist with an adulterous heart. The stillness of the Lord cannot coexist with a cheating heart. The stillness of the Lord cannot coexist with a vengeful heart. The, 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 the stillness of the Lord cannot coexist with, with a heart that's chasing anything but Him. We must recognize. What is causing the turbulent waters in our lives? In a river, the turbulent waters are caused by rocks and logs, right? If you want a peaceful river, you have to remove the debris that breaks up the flow, right? You've got to take out the rocks, you've got to take out the logs. If there is turbulence in your life, the question is, what is causing it? There's a very good chance you already know the answer to that question. If you're suffering through turbulence, what is the cause. There can be no stillness, there can be no peace as long as those rocks and as long as those logs are messing up the flow of the Lord. Look at what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5. If your right eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go to hell. Is it your right eye that's messing with the peaceful flow of the Lord? Is it your right hand? Is it lust? Is it addiction? Is it greed? Is it gluttony? Is it ego? Is it self-hate? Uh, self what is it for you? 
The Bible tells us, church, that God has blessings stored up in heaven for us. And when we're saved, we become co-heirs with Jesus. When we are saved, we become children of God. We are welcomed into the family. And God wants to pour out blessing upon blessing upon blessing on his favorite children. Hear me, church. You are loved by your heavenly father. You were created to excel. He has created you to be a blessing. He has created you to be blessed. But are you in a position to receive the blessing? Or are you living in turbulent waters? Are you giving in to your simple desires because you think they'll get you where you need to go faster? Are you unwilling to trust God's timetable for your life? Are you unwilling to trust God's plan for your life? Maybe today, maybe the first time you're beginning to recognize some generational sins that have hurt your family. Think back to your family for a moment. Think to your parents and their parents. Can you draw a line from their indiscretions down to you and see how it's played out in your life? Are you realizing, for the, maybe for the first time, the chains that you're in because of generational sin? We sing a lot of songs about Jesus being a chain breaker. But do we believe it? I see people sing those songs about Jesus being a, a chain breaker, and yet they're still living with generational sin. They're not willing to step forward and pray, Jesus, break the chains. He can break any chain that is on your life. He can break any chain that's on your family. No generational sin can stand against Jesus. No generational curses can stand against Jesus. Personal note, it's not on my sermon. Uh, as you know, my brother was killed when he was 20. My mom's brother died uh, when his apartment caught on fire when he was 23. Uh, my uh, great-grandmother lost her firstborn. I was sitting around my parents' house in Ball Ground. We lived up there with, with our um, spiritual covering, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Carlos and Maria Corona. And uh, we were talking to Dr. Maria, Liam and I were, about uh, the loss of my brother and the loss of my uncle. And we started to share that it's been the firstborn uh, son in going back generations. And we never really thought about it. And she, it, she clued in and said, this is a generational curse on your family. And she prayed over us. And she broke that curse. And she looked at me, and, she, and with a prophetic word, she said, Jared, you will see all of your children grow up. And I said, praise God. No generational sin, no generational curse can stand up to the name of Jesus Christ. Do you believe this today? Reuben made one decision that tore down God's blessing on his family. And so today, church, let's make one decision that helps us and our family step into God's blessing. It takes just one decision, one decision, one decision that can lead to life or it can lead to death for you and your family, for you and your community. One decision. And frankly, you can never know the full impact of a decision before you make the decision. So the question is, are you willing to gamble with your life? Are you willing to gamble with your children's life? Reuben gambled, and he lost. Will you? This morning we're going to share in communion. I know one decision that will never backfire on us. And that's the decision to sit down at the Lord's table and break bread with him. See, at Jesus' table, all is welcome. At Jesus' table, there is peace. At Jesus' table, stillness reigns. We believe that because this is Jesus' table. Everyone's welcome. Even the Reubens in the room are welcome to the Lord's table. But the sin of the Lord's table requires one thing. It requires us to repent of our sins. We have to name those rocks and those logs that are causing turbulence in our lives. It might be a tiny pebble that we thought wasn't that big of a deal, but now we're starting to realize, yeah, that little pebble is causing a lot of problems. Or it might be a boulder. But it's time for the church to repent. 
Jesus says, be still. That's his blessing for you today. Stillness is available to you today. I know there are some folks here today who need some stillness. You're, you're overwhelmed. You're scared. You're worried. You're ticked off. This past week, this past month has been nothing but turbulence in your life. Hear me, child of God. Stillness is available to you today. But you have to name the rock. You have to name the log. You have to name it. You have to repent of it and ask Jesus to forgive you. So who needs some stillness? Who needs some stillness today? Who's ready to say goodbye to those turbulent waters? Who's ready to say goodbye to those rapids that have just been beating you to death? Who's ready to get their lives and the lives of generations to come back on track? In a moment, you'll be invited to come forward for communion. You'll receive the bread, and then you'll dip it into the cup and eat it. And as you receive the body and blood of Jesus, I want to call you. I want to call on you to, to call on the Prince of Peace to bring peace into your life. So repent. Ask for forgiveness. Receive the blessing today. Do not leave here today, church, not having dealt with your turbulent waters. Kneel on these pillows, stand around these pillows, and pray until you receive stillness and peace. Don't go another step until you've dealt with this today. Hear me, this is not about you. It's about your marriage. It's about your children. It's about your children's children. Jesus says, be still and be blessed. And now I invite you to come and get it. So I'm going to pray and then I'll invite you forward for communion. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, I can look back at my, my own week and I can see the turbulent waters. That I have not been at peace and I have not been still. And I know the cause. I know the reason I'm feeling uneasy and worried and stressed out. And so, Lord, I repent of that. I repent of those times where instead of coming to you with those feelings, I've, I've held them in or I've, I've allowed them to, to control my behavior and my tone of voice with my wife and my kids. So, Lord, I, I confess my turbulent week and my turbulent life this past week. And I ask you to forgive me. Lord, I don't know what, the, what everyone else's life has been like. I don't know how many turbulent waters are represented in this room today. But, Lord, if there's anyone in this room right now who can recognize they are living in turbulent waters... I pray right now your Holy Spirit would just illuminate those rocks and those logs that's causing all of the, the trouble so that we can name them and that we, we can remove them from our lives. Maybe we are like Reuben and we've got a lustful heart and that's driving us to do things that we shouldn't do. Maybe we have a greedy heart. Maybe we have a selfish heart. Whatever it is, Lord. Maybe we have an angry heart. And we can see the turbulence that that's causing, that the turbulence in our marriage, the turbulence in our family life. And we, we can see how, how, how we get it from our dad or we get it from our mom. And we can see maybe for the first time that it's a generational sin. It's a generational curse. And today, Lord, let us say it stops today. Today, we are calling on the name of Jesus to break some chains, to break apart generational sin, to break down generational curses, and to let our families be set free, and to live in stillness and peace. So I don't know what it is for each of us today, Lord, but I ask that whatever we bring to you, you would take it, and that we would know that we are forgiven today, that we would leave here, Lord Jesus, Walking in stillness and peace. I pray peace upon our lives. I pray peace upon our marriages, upon our relationships. Let us be still. Trust in you. Live according to your commands. For this all in the name of Jesus.